live. Um, you know, I've been trying to do more and more of these because I think that they're important. And again, you can see the Christmas that we're getting rid of back there. But what I want everybody to understand is I'm going to teach a little bit about immunology today. I'm going to teach about the process of learning. I'm going to teach about the COVID vaccine and some common questions that I'm seeing on YouTube um, based on analytics that I'm seeing. And I want people to understand everything that's going on in the world that uh, is happening in regards to the pandemic. Now, the last three or four nights, whatever, I've been on call in the ICU and the pandemic is really heavy, right? And it's not like there's more patients to take care of. I mean, there is, but you know, people will always argue about the numbers and say, oh, well, the numbers are no different than they were previously, which is fine. It's really about the severity of illness. People are so sick, right? So you already have ICU patients that are just always sick. And now you have all these patients on the floor in the ICU that are even more sick because of the presence of the virus, right? Uh, and the presence of the virus in their system causing inflammation. Now, what I wanted to get into with this episode of the process is I'm just going to tell you over a course of a minute of the things that we all do as physicians to be able to bring information to you, right? To be able to bring you information that is true and correct. Now, we all went to medical school, right? MD, DO, whatever, PA. We all went to medical school of some kind or PA school of some kind. Um, that's four years after four years of college. And then... We do three, you know, anywhere from one to five years of a residency, whatever, maybe seven years in some cases. And then we do a fellowship after that. So like for me, four years of medical school, three years of residency, three years of pulmonary critical care fellowship. So like 10 years of extra schooling after college to learn how to do what I do. Now in the process of doing that, I also learned how to study what I do. I learned how to read about what I do. I learned how to evaluate medical literature to a certain extent. I learned how to apply what I'm reading into my clinical practice, right? And we don't have answers for everything. That's number one, all right? So there's a lot of people out there who, um, again, and we all practice evidence-based medicine, but there's not evidence for every single thing that we do. There's just not. And so some of the things that we do, we have to apply physiology and mechanisms of what we know clinically and be able to make our best clinical decision. And that's all based on things that we read and outcomes. None of it's voodoo, we don't make this stuff, all right? So before I get into the common questions about the COVID vaccine, which I think are important, and that's what we're gonna address here, I wanna be able to explain to you immunology. Immunology is the study of the white blood cells, how they communicate, how they recognize self and they recognize foreign, all right? We have to understand that the instructions for the building blocks of our body is within our DNA, right? When the DNA gets unzipped, because it's a double helix, it gets transcripted into RNA. And then when the RNA gets coded, we call that translation, you develop a protein. And then the protein goes off in the endoplasmic reticulum and it travels to where it needs to go in the cell and then either it's going to go ahead and get secreted by the cell to go to the rest of the body to go do what it needs to do. I mean, that's just basically how life works. Now, I think about immunology, which is the study of white blood cells. Again, there's many different subsets of white blood cells, okay? There's many different subsets of white blood cells. And the white blood cell's job is to identify foreign antigens and create an inflammatory response that allows us to Identify the antigen, be able to attack the antigen, and get rid and clear the antigen, okay? That's what white blood cells are supposed to do. Now, as they grow up, they go through the bone marrow, they go through this organ called the thymus, which is where they can understand what is self. They recognize the proteins and the sugars that are on the cell membranes of ourselves, and if they bind too much, usually they're told to go die when they're in the thymus, right? If they don't bind at all, they still may go and die, right? But also, if they bind just enough, we're going to keep them around because we want them to be able to know what self is, not attack self, and be able to recognize foreign. That's how they grow up in our body, all right? And that's just the gist. Now, there are many different types of white blood cells. There are neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells, eosinophils, basophils, 
natural killer cells, natural killer T cells, B cells, traditional T cells, okay? And then there's also innate lymphoid cells, all right? And then there's other types of monocytes. There's many different subsets of these white blood cells. And the way that we recognize them in our body is by what they look like on the outside. That is, their cell membranes tell us who they are, okay? Now, the way that the immune system works in recognizing foreign, it's a simple concept for people to understand. This is really, really easy. If something foreign enters your body, gets in your bloodstream, right, your white blood cells are going to notice its presence. They're going to get activated, right? Your neutrophil is going to notice its presence. Usually that's the acute cell that's there first. Your macrophage is there to kind of eat the foreign substance, eat the antigen, breaks it up into pieces and displays those different pieces on its cell membrane to the dendritic cell, right? Or to another type of cell so that that cell can learn how to create a defense system against said antigen, right? So the antigen gets displayed, right? And we call this the MHC1 complex, right? All cells can have an MHC1. Antigen presenting cells have MHC2. These are just names, who cares? And what I mean by antigen presenting cell is a cell that can break up that foreign substance and then present it to another type of white blood cell to make an antibody or to make a T cell that can bind, all right? That's just how the immune system works, right? It's a very, very simple concept to understand. What I notice is that there's a lot of physicians out there, especially the ones that are spreading misinformation that don't quite understand this concept, which is okay, right? But this is immunology kind of 101, all right? Antigen gets recognized as foreign, body creates a defense system against said antigen. And that's done with making antibodies, making B cells, making T cells that can all recognize antigen, even NK T cells, all right? They can all recognize when a cell has a foreign antigen. So in other words, if you're infected, if your cell is infected with a virus or bacteria or a fungus, right, it can get on the inside of that cell. Some of these can, there's intracellular bacteria, but let's really focus on viruses here, which are intracellular. Viruses need our cells to be able to replicate. So the virus gets on the inside, our body recognizes some of the proteins as foreign, cuts it up, and then it displays these antigens on its cell membrane, right? And then the cells come over, recognize that the cell is infected and start to create antibodies, B cells and T cells that can recognize these different epitopes, right? That's when the proteins all split up into different pieces. And then once they recognize that, they are able to kind of go after the cells that are infected and kind of start to begin to clear the virus. That is how the immune system works. Basic immunology 101. So now let's get into the vaccines, right? We're eight minutes into this. Let's get into the vaccines and how they work. So when you look at the vaccines, okay, there are two vaccines that are out right now. They're both mRNA vaccines, right? There's Moderna and there's Pfizer, all right? So what are the vaccines, right? That was one of the common questions. How, does they, how do they work? So remember what I said, DNA becomes RNA, RNA becomes protein. These are mRNA vaccines. mRNA means messenger RNA. That just means the RNA that is narrowed down the most to be coded, right? RNA is a big, long molecule. And what our body naturally does, it'll take out some pieces of it because it doesn't need it. And it shortens it, right? That's what mRNA is. It's just narrowed down RNA. That mRNA molecule, once it's injected in you, is going to get inside the cells. That's why it's surrounded by fat. We're going to get into the ingredients in a second. Once it gets inside the cell, the cell recognizes the mRNA, it actually translates it into a protein. So it translates it into the protein. The protein that is being coded for is the spike protein, right? This famous protein you guys have all heard about. The spike protein turns into, um, is a protein in our cell. And then what happens is that spike protein gets recognized as, you guessed it, foreign. Once it gets recognized as foreign, it gets broken up into different pieces. In other words, if you're looking at me as a person, it can recognize me from the left, from the right, from the front, from the back, from up here, from down here, from the this diagonally, this diagonally, this way, that way, this piece, that piece. So it creates many different epitopes 
right? And it puts these different epitopes on the cell membrane, right? And then the antibodies can bind to all different types of epitopes, all different pieces of the spike protein, right? So it can bind to the spike protein that's in the middle, the spike protein on the bottom, the spike protein on the top, spike protein that's in between the top and the bottom, but not in the middle, right? That's how it works. And so the body makes antibodies, T cells and B cells that can recognize this, right? That's how the vaccine works. And once it's recognized, then it's able to neutralize the spike protein. Now, the question is, is like, why do you need a vaccine and what happens naturally? So naturally when you get infected, this process takes seven to 10 days, right? So in the, in the process of that, the time of that, that's when the immune system gets revved up. To be able to do that, it has to secrete certain molecules. These molecules are called cytokines and chemokines. These molecules cause the fatigue, the inflammation, because they're recruiting other cells to an area, right? But they cause the headache, right? They cause the, uh, the, uh, the fevers, because all these molecules are doing their thing. They're going to recruit other cells. And as the body is getting revved up, you develop fever, you develop fatigue. And when you're naturally getting sick from this, this process of making an antibody and a B cell and a T cell takes seven to 10 days, right? Then once you're infected and you develop the appropriate immune response, the next time you see it, the process might take a day because your body already knows how to defend itself. So when you think about the vaccine, once you're injected with it, you make the RNA, right? You have the RNA in there, you make the protein. Protein gets recognized as foreign, broken up into little pieces, you get different antibodies, different B cells and T cells, right? And again, when it's just the spike protein, you don't have to worry about replication. The virus isn't replicating because there's nothing else. There's nothing else in there. It's just the spike protein. That's it. As my boys say, that's it, D-A-S-S-I-T. So once that gets recognized as foreign and you develop all of this, your body knows how to defend itself. It knows how to neutralize the spike protein, which is the main problem in this virus. The main problem in this virus is that the spike protein binds so well to our cells that our immune system starts tripping. It really gets overactivated in a lot of people. And you can see that in some of the people that are dying, some of the people that have developed severe infection. You can see that. You can see its overactivity. So what you want to do is you want to create an efficient inflammatory response. You want to let the body recognize what the spike protein looks like, which is what we're doing with the vaccine. And then once it recognizes what the spike protein looks like, it remembers how to defend itself. So when it sees coronavirus for real, for real, it already knows, oh, I seen this. I have, I can make antibodies to the spike protein and I can neutralize infection. I can bind to the spike protein and not allow the virus to bind to the cells. It already knows that because it already recognizes that. That's the whole point of this. And then there are memory cells, memory Bs and memory Ts that remember how to do it. B cells are the white blood cells that actually make antibodies. When you look at a B cell, they actually have antibodies on the outside of their membrane, but they also make antibodies that are secreted into the bloodstream. In the bloodstream, there's five types of antibodies, IgA, IgM, IgE, IgD, and IgG. Nobody really knows what IgD does, but IgG is the most abundant antibody in the serum typically, right? It's in your bloodstream, it flows around your bloodstream. IgA is typically in the mucosal sites, so it's in your nose, your mouth, that kind of an area. IgM usually flows around your bloodstream as a pentamer, so that means that there's five of them that are kind of connected together, just surveying the field. Okay, and then IgE is an antibody that's really responsible for parasites and in the Western world, at least a lot of allergies. Okay, I measure that antibody level all the time in my patients. But again, that's how the vaccine works. It's a very simple concept. So all these people talking about, you know, oh, the vaccine, you know, typical vaccines recognize a piece of the virus. I was watching some nurse practitioner talk about this today. Recognize a piece of the virus and no, this one, this vaccine doesn't do that. Yes, that's precisely what it does. This vaccine is a piece of the virus. It is only the spike protein. The reason why you do that is because if you give somebody coronavirus that's dead or that's weakened, I mean, you don't ever know that the virus can actually gain its function back and become very virulent again. Who knows? So nobody really was risking to do that. Naturally, your question right now, because you understand immunology right now, after this explanation, you have a general understanding. Remember, as my daughter has told you, as I've told you, there are seven coronaviruses that infect humans. 
three of which are very severe, MERS, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2. And then there's four, HKU-1, OC-43, NL-63, and 229E. These are four coronaviruses that infect adults every single year, all right? There is a, uh, the common cold is caused by coronavirus in like 30% of adults, all right? So my question has always been, why don't we just infect people with a regular old coronavirus? Maybe that would offer some immunity because they're all structured the same way. They all have four structural proteins, membranous, spike, nucleocapsid, and envelope. These are the proteins on the outside of the membrane that can be seen, right? And then you have 16 non-structural proteins that are encoded by its RNA. Doesn't matter. So that's how they're all structured. So, and when you look in children, at least, because you might be asking yourself why do kids have less of a prevalence of this disease? But children are passing around coronavirus all the time. They're like little Petri dishes. As you know, kids get sick all the time. And so when you look in the literature and you look at the studies, you can actually see when you take a child's blood, you can actually see that they have antibodies towards spike and nucleocapsid and then envelope and some of the non-structural proteins. You can see in their bloodstream, they have more than adults actually do. So it seems to me that the longer you haven't been exposed to coronavirus, right, then the more likely you are probably to become severely ill. I have actually wondered if, if you look at the um, ages of people who are severe, like my, all my, my question is, is like, do they have, you know, school aged four or five, six year olds at home who are getting sick all the time? My guess, and this is just a guess, I don't know for sure. My guess is that people that do are probably less likely to get as severely ill just based on immunology. And again, this is just information that I know from years and years of studying immunology because in my life, in my clinic, as a physician, this is what I do, right? This is how I practice. So that is how the vaccine works in general, just that way. Very simple concept. mRNA gets converted into protein. Protein recognizes foreign, gets broken up into little pieces. Immune system recognizes different pieces of the spike protein and it remembers how to defend itself in case it ever sees it again. That's how the vaccine works, period, end of story. Another common question is that like, what is it actually doing? So when you think about SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. COVID-19 is the disease caused by the virus. What the vaccine actually does is it reduces disease severity and it reduces COVID-19. So it reduces disease. I'm not gonna sit here and say that it's gonna reduce the amount of virus that people are going to have or even pass around, but it reduces disease. So you can still probably get the virus, but you're not going to have as many symptoms and you may not present to the hospital or be hospitalized because you have the vaccine. That's what we saw in the studies. When you look at both Moderna's trial and Pfizer's trial, you can see at about day 12 after the first dose of vaccine, you can see a separation between the people who got coronavirus and the people who didn't. So there's a significant difference there. And that's when it starts to break off. Now, people ask, like, why do you need the booster shot? Well, you need the booster shot to just generate a little bit more immunity, right? To get more B cells, more T cells, more antibodies in your serum, right? Everybody just wanted to make certain that we could cause this virus to go extinct. We want to bring that R naught value down. The R naught value is when everybody says R, the R is two or the R is three, that's the average number of people who get infected by one person, right? The R naught value of measles is like 18 meaning one person's gonna infect 18, which is crazy, right? The r naught value of SARS-CoV-2 was, maybe is right now, I don't know, it was like five or something like that. It was crazy high. Um, I don't think it's that high anymore. It's somewhere between two and three. But that is how this works. And so we wanna reduce disease burden. I'm not gonna sit here and say that like, if you get the vaccine, you're not gonna be able to pass the virus on, right? Or again, I think that naturally, probably the less symptomatic you are, if you have the vaccine, you're probably, your infectious time is probably going to be reduced. It's going to be tough to study. We're going to look at that. Um, but it's very, very hard uh, to understand that. But it's hard, but it's, but it's important for you to know that you're reducing disease burden by getting the vaccine, which is why this vaccine is so, 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 so important. Okay. And I understand I've talked about it a lot. I've talked about it a lot um, to my community. I've talked about it a lot in my barbershop. Um, I want people to understand that this vaccine works, right? There are people out there who don't believe in germ theory, right? They don't believe that 
viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites actually cause infection? I do, right? That's how I was trained. That's what I've read. That's what I see clinically. And so it makes sense to me, right? When somebody comes into the hospital and they're sick and they're in shock, meaning their blood pressure is low, right? And they don't respond to any of the fluid I give them. They have, um, oh, we'll talk about that. Um, they have bacteria growing in their bloodstream, all right? Now, another question that's common is, you know, what's in the vaccine? What are the ingredients? So I had to write these down. And the reason I could write them down is because there's only like five or six ingredients in the vaccine. So when you look at the Moderna mRNA vaccine, the ingredients are lipids, which are fats, okay? Tromethamine, which is a buffer, a chemical buffer. It's like a bicarbonate buffer. Tromethamine hydrochloride, acetic acid, which is a simple carbon, sodium acetate, which is like salt, and sucrose, which is sugar. That's it. That's it. And look at the Pfizer vaccine. The ingredients are lipids, potassium chloride, salt, sodium phosphate, salt, sodium chloride, sucrose, dibasic sodium phosphate dihydrate, and monobasic potassium phosphate. They're just all salts, okay? And so they're all salts and sugars in mRNA. And people are like, oh, what are the nanoparticles? Here's the deal. Nanoparticles are lipids. They're little small fat droplets that surround the mRNA. The reason we're using these lipid nanoparticles is because these are gonna allow the mRNA vaccine to diffuse across the cell membrane, which is also made of lipids, to get inside the cell. That's the whole point of this, right? That's what was created. That's what took so long to be able to create these vaccines and make them effective is, is that, all right? So those are the ingredients of the vaccine. This is how the vaccine works. This is all really basic immunology one-on-one. There's nothing complicated about the way the vaccine works. There's nothing special. This is basic, basic immunology. And I understand if you're a clinician, if I understand that immunology was not your strong suit. It took a lot of effort for me to understand immunology the way that I do. And I'm not the best at it. I just love it and I can see it. Whenever you're thinking about a disease, when you're thinking about this disease, COVID-19, it is a result of the presence of a virus and it's autoimmune inflammation that gets activated like that. That's what causes severe disease. I'm gonna ask you guys one question if you guys are clinicians. If you guys are clinicians, I'm gonna ask you one question. How many people have you seen with SARS-CoV-2 viremia? That is the virus in the bloodstream. Exactly. Zero. You see CMV viremia, right? Um, you might see HSV viremia, right? But you're not seeing SARS-CoV-2 viremia, or we're not checking for it. The reason is, is because it's the inflammatory response that's causing the problem. So the spike protein binds to our receptors. It's called ACE2R. I'm not going to get into that. And the immune system gets activated so much that the inflammation where the virus is, that is the recruiting of the white blood cell where the virus is located, is so severe and so burdensome. There's so many cells that they begin to clog the organs. What's pneumonia? Your lung is essentially a bunch of pipes that lead to a bunch of balloons stacked on top of one another. That's all the lung is. There's blood vessels there too. What happens in pneumonia? Well, those balloons are full of crap, right? And pneumonia can be caused by bacteria, but then the white blood cells come to where the bacteria are and they fill up the balloons. So you can't gas exchange. You can't get oxygen in your bloodstream anymore, right? Because you have pneumonia. When you look at a chest x-ray, if you see white where you're normally supposed to see black, we call that pneumonia. What happens with SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19, severe COVID-19? You've got a bunch of white, on your chest x-ray because it's full of white blood cells, right? If you were to look at it under a microscope, as we've seen, you can see the white blood cells in the alveoli. It's not like overly burdened with a virus. There's a shit ton of white blood cells there. That is the problem. And so someone just asked me a question and they said, what is the theory behind using JAK inhibitors? So JAK inhibitors, and there's a study published in the New England Journal about two weeks ago on a JAK inhibitor called baricitinib combined with remdesivir, which is a viral RNA polymerase inhibitor. Now, it doesn't look like remdesivir does much in terms of mortality or really the clinical syndrome of 
um, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. But baricitinib is a JAK inhibitor. Janus kinases are enzymes that are activated during the inflammatory response. And what they're going to do is they're going to actually go to the nucleus of the cell and they're going to lead to increase in the production of some of the inflammatory products that lead to the recruitment of white blood cells into certain areas. And so the theory behind using baricitinib or a or Janus kinase inhibitor is to calm down the inflammatory response. In other words, you want to disconnect the phone lines. You don't want the white blood cells to call each other. Decadron or dexamethasone is the only drug that reduces mortality that we found thus far. What does that do, right? It essentially inhibits interleukin-1 and 2. It inhibits some of that cell communication of white blood cells. We use prednisone or decadron or these cor corticosteroids in all kinds of diseases, right? I use them all the time in the autoimmune lung diseases. So the, again, we recognized that the problem with the presence of this virus was the inflammatory response. That's the issue. So when you look at all of these drugs, all of them that we're studying right now, they're all modulating the immune system in some way, shape, or form. Let's look at the monoclonal antibodies, bamlanivimab and the Regeneron CoV-2 antibodies. What are those doing? Those are binding directly to the spike protein, right? They're doing what our immune system wants to do, trying to inhibit the spike protein's ability to bind to the cell, to our cells. When you look at the studies, and again, Bam Nanabinab study published a few days ago on inpatients, it doesn't work. Here's the thing about disease, and this is very, very frustrating and it sucks. We take snapshots of disease. We're taking photos. Disease is constantly evolving and progressing. It is going. It is going and going and going and going. And as it goes so does the inflammatory response. And so again, in the beginning of all this, one of the, and I don't know if it's a mistake, I understand the reasoning behind suggesting this, but one of the pieces of advice that we would give patients, and that was said by the leaders of the country, was to not go to the hospital unless you were really sick, unless you were really short of breath, unless you had developed chest pain. But if you were SARS-CoV-2 positive, the fact of the matter is, is that your inflammatory process could get activated. So my question has always been, is that the wrong advice? Because if you wait seven, eight days in, that inflammatory response is going. Disease is evolving. It keeps going and going and going and going and going. It doesn't stop. And so if that's still going, if you come in at day seven, which is the median time to hospital presentation, and the median time to ICU presentation, was day eight, 24 hours later. So we were getting really, really sick people. And then they were getting sicker within 24 hours. And you think that our therapies are going to be able to reverse that? It doesn't happen. And that's the issue. And that's the, one of the problems with evidence-based medicine is you have to have objective disease. And the way that we describe objective disease is by physical manifestations, cough, shortness of breath, hypoxia, hypoxemia, right? You have to define it objectively. And I'm not saying this is wrong because I think this is the right thing. This is what you have to do. I get it. But that's a problem when you have diseases such as autoimmune conditions and diseases such as this is what are you going to use to objectively define the illness? Someone might be SARS-CoV-2 positive, but they might not have the genetics, right? Or the serum that's going to take them all the way to that inflammatory phase and that scarring phase and that phase that's going to kill them. They might not get there because genetically they just can't. Their immune system is efficient, blah, blah, blah. The problem is, is we don't know who that is and who that isn't. That's the issue, right? And so again, like the piece of advice of staying home until you're really sick, I don't know. I just don't know. Like In a perfect world, you would love to give everybody that has SARS-CoV-2 medicine as soon as they were diagnosed, right? In a perfect world, you would have home testing kits and people could test themselves every day. And as soon as they were positive, get a monoclonal antibody treatment, get something, because then you know it's early. Because if you're negative one day and you're positive the next, it's probably early in the disease course, right? If you were exposed, maybe you're exposed four days ago, 14 days ago, who knows? But again, if you're testing yourself every day, 
then you would know. But that's difficult to do. You're not really going to do that. But that's the issue with this condition, right? And again, my thoughts are practical ones. This isn't rocket science. This is just how the disease works. And what you have is you have a bunch of physicians who, you know, like infectious disease doctors, are used to treating illness that is really acting infectious. You can grow it, you can see it, you give a treatment, you inhibit it. But this disease is more than that. It's not only contagious, but it also activates the inflammatory response. So you're going to be using therapies that you aren't really used to using. You don't recognize them. And so you're treating them as if they're an antibiotic because you're treating this as if this is actually an organism that's causing all the issue when it's not. It's not the organism. The presence of the organism is causing the issue, but the issue is the white blood cells responding. That's the issue. The other issue is you just don't know who's going to respond that way and who's not going to respond that way. It's just very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. And I think part of the cluster that happens with a presentation of coronavirus is you have a bunch of physicians, myself included, who just don't know what phase you're in, what actually is going on in your body, right? When you look in the microscope at a lung that has SARS-CoV-2 or that dies of COVID-19, you can see CD8 cells, types of T cells, and you can see NK cells. Um, those are the cells that you see, right? So the inflammatory response is really, really activated. And it's like, well, how do you turn those off, right? And it just, it's so, so hard. Because I can tell you I've got 70-year-olds that come in that have all kinds of comorbidities that, with all due respect, if they got it and they're in the hospital, they should die. <laughs> like, that's crazy. Like, you're just kind of like, oh, my gosh. But they're doing very well. And I've got 40-year-olds that come in and do really, really crappy. And we just don't have a way of defining who's who and what's what. So what's the result of this? What do you do about it? You vaccinate. That's why vaccination is important. Because at least we know that when you vaccinate, you give your body a shot. You're giving your body the ability to recognize a possible protein that is causing the virulence of this disease. You're giving your body a chance. People are afraid of it. And I understand they're afraid of it. I get it. People are, people don't understand the immunology of, of the world, of your body. There are over 200,000 life-threatening food allergies every year in the United States. Life-threatening. Why? Because your body can respond to anything. Anything. It can just decide right now, boom, I want to respond to that feather. I want to respond to that piece of pollen. It just happens. It sucks, but it's true. And so when you think about this, when you think about the immunology of it all, you're giving your body a fighting chance. A fighting chance. Yes, it can have a reaction. These reactions, they're not side effects. They're natural reactions to the presence of antigen. Natural. And you have to understand that. When I get my second shot in next week, I'm going to have pain. Why? I was just injected with a needle, for God's sake. I'm going to activate the inflammatory response locally. I'm going to have fatigue. Why? Because cytokines are getting secreted and activated, and my body recognizes the spike protein. I might even have a fever. I might even get a runny nose or a scratchy throat, because essentially I'm making my body sick, because I'm allowing it to recognize the spike. That's it. That's immunology. Now, again, if you don't believe in germ theory, cool, fine, no big deal. If you, you know, if you have another belief and you want to leave it in God's hand, that's fine, too. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm done arguing with people spreading misinformation. I will give out information. I will tell you the science, the philosophy, the mechanism of action behind all this stuff. Because I think that I can teach it well. I will tell you that, all right? 
But the whole point of the vaccine is to give your body a fighting chance. People always try to compare apples to oranges. They ask about influenza. They ask about herpes. They ask about all kinds of other things. You have to understand that viruses are all different. Every single virus is different, right? Why do you need a vaccine for influenza every year? Well, you need a vaccine for influenza every year because the hemagglutinin protein and the neuraminidase protein, the proteins that our body recognizes, change the way they look completely almost every year. You've heard H1N1, H2N3, H5N6. It's what happens, right? But for most people, most people, you know, healthcare workers get the flu vaccine because we see it all the time and we don't want to die from the flu. That's the whole point of the vaccine is to not die of the illness. But like, it's really beneficial to people over 65 and with lung disease. That's what it's really beneficial for. Um, so again, that's why you get the flu vaccine every year because it completely changes the way it looks. People ask about this vaccine and they've asked, and I had a question a minute ago, they asked about, are we going to need this vaccine every year? The true answer, honestly, the honest to God answer is I don't know. But the way in which this spike protein is mutating, it doesn't seem to be mutating in such a way that's going to require us to use something different. We might need a boost, right? But I, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. But that's what's going on. People are asking about this mutation in the UK and now it showed up in Colorado. Like, what's up with this mutation? Here's what's up with the mutation. Again, it's a few amino acids on the spike protein that have changed. But remember, we all break the spike protein down into different little pieces. So we can create different epitopes that the antibodies are going to recognize. So is the mutation a big deal in terms of the vaccine? Probably not. Probably not, depending. Um, people seem to be more contagious or more infectious or something with this uh, variant because probably of the spike protein and the way that it can bind and the virus's ability to get through things and get inside. Um, that's going to be an issue. But as far as the vaccine, nah, viruses mutate. Our immune system has evolved with viruses. Viruses have been around since the beginning of time. They've been around. They've been around humans. They've been infecting people forever. You think that all these civilizations that disappeared off the face of the earth just were taken up in the ships by aliens? I'm not saying I don't believe in aliens, because I do, but I'm just saying, like, no, dude, it was disease. Right? It's Francisella, the plague. It was, you know, um, uh, the Spanish flu. It was like disease killed people. We just didn't have the technology back then. We didn't have vaccines back then. Now we're so damn used to being vaccinated, right? We're so damn used to being able to cause diseases to be extinct that we become spoiled. We become so spoiled that we're like, oh, I'm just going to be natural. Well, that's because you already took advantage. All the other diseases that could have killed you have been eliminated because of modern science, because of people getting vaccines. So this is just another little hurdle. None of us are promised tomorrow. None of us are promised a healthy life. We all do things that are necessary to maintain our health, protect our families, and get up tomorrow morning and do what we want to do. Part of that is going to probably be getting this vaccine. If you're an anti-vaxxer, I get it, no problem. I'm not going to argue with you over it. I understand why you don't want to get it. I understand your concern. I understand vaccines can cause reactions. I'm just willing to accept that risk. Right? I'm just willing to accept that risk. Now, someone's going to say tomorrow, they're going to talk about this nurse that got the vaccine seven days before they got SARS CoV 2. Right? How did they do that? They got vaccinated. Well, there's two questions really to ask. Number one, which was already answered, like how many days after the vaccine? So it was seven days. The incubation period of this virus is four to 14 days. So they could have easily been exposed beforehand. That's number one. Um, number two, is, wait a second, the nurse had SARS-CoV-2 and they had the vaccine. Did they end up in the hospital? No. Did they end up in the ICU? No. So wait, did the vaccine maybe help their immune system be efficient? Maybe. Maybe. They could have just checked his titers of antibody and seen what they were. If they were really high, the immune system probably did a job, probably helped them. I don't know. But if the patient, but if the guy didn't end up in the hospital, which he didn't, end up in the ICU, which he didn't, that's great. It could be, yeah, naturally he's a young person, like no big deal. But the other answer could be, well, the vaccine maybe maybe helped him be more efficient. We already know at day twelve there's a big separation, right? Maybe it helped him. I don't know, but that's entirely possible. 
that can absolutely happen. Absolutely can happen. Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind that can happen. It's not surprising to me. All of these things are not surprising. The Bell's palsy, it's a reaction. It happens in a lot of people. The prevalence of it was no higher than the general population. Could have been coincidental. Or yes, the vaccine could have caused a reaction that caused Bell's palsy. Maybe. I don't know for sure. But the prevalence wasn't any higher in that population, people who received the vaccine, than the general population. So you have to take all these things into consideration. People don't talk about the 200,000 food allergies that cause life-threatening disease. People die of that. Um, you know, somebody just asked me, so does the nurse that was positive get the second shot since they had SARS-CoV-2? It's a good question. That's a good question. I can tell you that they probably don't need it for three to six months because they already got one shot and they had the virus. So I don't know. If I were that nurse, if I were that guy, I would get the second shot. I would. Right? I mean, it's three weeks from then. Like, I would. All right? But is it recommended? No one knows. Somebody will come out with it, and the CDC will come out with some guideline tomorrow saying that. And generally, the CDC says, well, if you um, have had SARS-CoV-2, you are allotted. You can wait 90 days to get your vaccine. You don't have to, but you can't. There have been nurses in my unit that have been infected within 90 days that have gotten the vaccine. They've been just fine. Um, let me see what other questions here. What's in the vaccine we talked about? Oh, when is the vaccine going to be available for the general public? Everything for me has been a lot earlier than I thought. I didn't think we were going to have a vaccine until next summer. I got one two weeks ago. Um, people are saying May, June. I bet it's a little earlier for the general public. I bet it's probably March, April. That's my guess. I don't know for sure, but that's my guess. We got to handle all the healthcare workers right now got to handle all the healthcare workers. The reason why I think it's going to be earlier is this. Uh, when I'm talking about the general public, I'm talking about like families for people who are healthcare workers. That to me is general public. And so when you think about hospitals and the way in which they order vaccines, you're looking at all the physicians that are on staff at their hospital. Most physicians go to more than one hospital, right? If you're a private practice physician, you go to more than one hospital. So you're going to have all this leftover vaccine, I think. And so then they're going to probably start offering it to physician families. That's my guess. I don't know. And that to me is a general public, but that's, that's a guess. I don't know for sure, but that's my guess. Um, anyways, that's what I think. So listen, this is a very special in the process episode on vaccine, vaccine immunology. Christmas is over. So we're getting rid of the stuff. Trees outside. I'm going to pull it around in the front pretty soon. But I wanted you guys to understand immunology 101. Understand white blood cells, the different subsets, what they do, right? How they recognize foreign antigen, how our body tolerates self going through the thymus and its own maturity. Um, I want you guys to get the basis of immunology. I have a bunch of videos on here that talk about the basics of immunology. Watch them. If you have questions, email me, message me, comment on here. I don't care. I'm here to answer those questions. I don't know the answer. I'm going to read about it. I'll learn about it. And then I'll answer it. So just understand that. And listen, we are fatigued. We're exhausted. But like we're doing our job. It's what we're supposed to do. You know, people call us healthcare heroes. This is our job. This is what we're supposed to do. It's what we're passionate about. We're going to continue to do it. Um, and, you know, the hospitals that I work, where I work, I'll help them anytime they need it. If they call me right now, I would go. So I appreciate you guys being here on Medicine Dig Constructed. I appreciate you guys watching this new live series, The Process. Um, I'm just here to arm you guys with information. Next week, I'll be able to provide you with some more ammunition. We're going to be back on our regularly scheduled program with Medicine Dig Constructed, releasing on Fridays after this week, after the holiday. Um, we're going to start with a business one because that's what's important. Um, private practice physician lives. Um, thanks for being here again, you guys. I really appreciate you being here on this live for 45 minutes. It'll probably be posted up here um, pretty soon by the end of the night. Take care.